All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're well. Um, we are excited at the Library of Michigan to be able to offer this fun, um, engaging webinar today. Uh, we're going to be talking about escape rooms, and we have with us Stephanie and Laura. And I know that they have their own uh, introductions to do today, so I'm not going to take that from them. But I just want to take a moment to let you know that um, in the chat box, there are links to today's survey um, at the end of the webinar, if you could please do that. Um, it helps us to support more webinars and training such as this through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. There's also a link to the slides for today, so you don't have to jot everything down. Um, you can access those slides at the link there. And our Books Alive, Escape the Nursery Rhymes um, that Stephanie created and is there for you to play with before or after um, the webinar. Hopefully not during, because we're going to want you to listen. Um, and so with that said, I'm going to let Stephanie and Laura say hello here. Hi hey everybody, um, I'm Stephanie Reinhardt. I'm a children's librarian at the Auburn branch of the Bay County Library System. Um, I've been building escape rooms for about, uh, I guess it's about four years now, um, for physical ones. And like many of you, I had to start from scratch this spring and learn to build digital escape rooms, so. My name is Laura Boltman. Um, I've been a children's librarian for a while. I've worked in Illinois, New York, New Jersey, and now in Michigan. Uh, my favorite date night is to go escaping with my husband uh, and to learn new ideas for puzzles. Um, I am currently uh, helping my first grader through his first year of Portage Virtual School, hopefully his only year of Portage Virtual School. I'm uh, earning a degree in early childhood education, and I'm also trying to crochet a blanket that looks like a Petoskey stone. I'm not sure which of these activities is the hardest. <laughs> so we're going to get started um, with the whys of escape rooms. Um, you're here, so you're obviously interested. The next question is, how do you get other people interested to make sure that uh, other people think it's a good use of your time, both for administration and for schools, if you choose to take it there? So for schools, there's actually a few really good reasons that you can use to introduce the idea of using escape rooms as an outreach program to teachers. Um, we in Bay County um, have used them a lot of times at the beginning of the school year to allow teachers to see their class in kind of a problem solving dynamic without too much direct oversight. It lets teachers really begin to understand their class makeup. And when I most frequently use them is right before, before or after holiday breaks. Um, kids have often a very difficult time paying attention to lessons and letting them burn their energy. Using escape rooms can give teachers a much needed break and give you contact with, your, with the students right before they're going to be off school and have more time to visit you at the public library. You can also alter them to fit curriculum standards. The very first one I created was based on animals. Um, so it applied to uh, different curriculum points throughout uh, K through five, and we just kind of adjusted the conversations in order to fit those curriculum points. Um, in first grade, I often do a syllable related one, and the teachers love that it relates to a topic they're trying to teach. Um, we've also used it as an incentive or reward for students who meet certain behavioral or academic goals, um, just kind of as a, a cheap field trip for schools to offer, because a lot of times they can't afford to take a bus or do other things, but they want to offer something fun for the students who have achieved. Um, there's also a lot of logic and math goals. You'll see those here. It's just a lot of figuring out how to work through a problem step by step and how to discuss and possibly refute logic that other people use. Obviously, they're never going to use the phrases that are on this slide, but um, it's, uh, it's important for you to know so that when people say, why would we include this? This is silly. Well, actually, these logic games are very important for developing habits of mind. There's also the big one. For me, social emotional is really the reason I design escape rooms. Um, you'll see the five core competen competencies from Castle, self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. Building these in real time and letting adults see them working through these problems 
gives a real good teaching opportunity for how to continue building those things. One of the important parts of an escape room in a class or with children, a large group, is it lets you have a debrief session where you can talk about what you observed, what the students observed, and what their goal would be for good behavior or good teamwork. And how can you bridge the gap between what the students saw and what you saw and where they think they should be. And it lets them have some agency in figuring out what good social emotional um, teamwork is. All right, so we're gonna start by talking about in-person escape rooms, physical escape rooms, the kind that we could set up in the before times and that hopefully we will come back to at some point. Um, oh my, am I ringing or someone else? Uh, okay, if you could do the next slide, please. So here's a rundown of the step for physical escape rooms. First, you decide a theme, you decide your goal, you find your locks and your boxes, you set up your puzzles, you lay everything out on a table, make a big mess, and then put everything in order. Create yourself a code sheet so you remember how to reset the room and what to put where. Have someone do a test run, and then decorate. Although this is optional, it is fun. All right. Uh, all right, let's go through all these steps one by one. Next slide, please. So the first thing you need to decide is whether or not you want a theme. Now themes can be really helpful because they can focus the room, they can give it structure, and they can get the kids excited about it. It's a great marketing tool if you say you're doing a Star Wars escape room. Uh, there was so much more excitement for that than there was for our dinosaur escape room, even though both of them were quality experiences. If you're having trouble picking a theme, Think about what pop culture things are popular right now, or even what do you have a lot of? I happen to have a lot of stuffed animals, so we made a zoo-themed uh, escape room based on that. Do you have stuff left over from a unicorn party? Could you theme it around a book character? Uh, things like that. So whatever you have a lot of and several puzzles of, uh, that's a good place to start. Um, the problem, of course, with the theme is that you'll need materials to fit it, and it can give some of the clues away, although we'll talk about that a little further on. Next, please. So the next thing you do is you pick a goal. So obviously you're not gonna lock people in the room because you know, fire codes, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to decide how they know when they've won. This was the goal of our Star Wars room, was to find Baby Yoda, find and rescue Baby Yoda. So you see Baby Yoda there. I made him. He has been through several escape rooms at this point and is no longer as cute, um, but he's definitely more loved, more real at this point. Um, for my dinosaur escape room, I had them find a car that they had to drive away. So they found a remote control and they just hit forward and the car was hidden and it appeared out of nowhere, which was super fun. Um, you can do an object gathering one. I had a colleague do one where they were throwing a party and you had to find the seven things that you needed to throw the party. Um, or you can have a code. Um, in Harry Potter rooms, you can have them, you know, say a specific spell at the end. Um, and that's how you know that, that they've won. So once you've decided what you want to do, it's time to find your supplies. Next slide, please. You are gonna need a lot of locks and a lot of things that lock. So find anything that you already have in your library that locks. If you have a cabinet that locks, if you have a, um, a file cabinet that no one's using that has a lock on it, if you have bike locks, um, you can borrow some of those. Uh, if you have old cash boxes that no one's using, those usually have locks on them. So raid all of your shelves, see what you can find. Um, double zippered bags also work great. You can lock the zippers to each other and then the bag can't be opened. If you've looked around and you found nothing, you can find some relatively inexpensive locks at um, Walmart or on Amazon or at Meijer. I like to buy different kinds of things. So here we have um, six different forms of locks. Obviously the one with the key. Um, there's a four digit combination lock. There's a four letter. There's a five letter. Um, the one in the bottom center is different shapes, so you can do different shapes as your code. And the one on the bottom right is a directional lock. Uh, these are lovely if you want to do arrows. They are, however, notoriously difficult to set and reset and to unlock, even if you know the combination. So if you're going to use one of those, you may, should make sure you run your patrons through how it's done. 
um, so that they don't get frustrated on that particular lock. We also happened to have a lock at one point that was five colors. So it looked like the one that says words, but it was five different color um, dots. That one was from Breakout EDU and it exploded like halfway through one of the escape room things that we were doing. It just had gotten reprogrammed too many times. Um, so part of the introduction in that room was watch out for that lock, it explodes. Um, but if you can find one like that, we haven't been able to find a replacement, but if you can find one, it, it's a really nice uh, wordless puzzle to have colors. So like kids who aren't quite reading yet would be able to use that lock. Next, please. Then you need things to lock. So we had a toolbox that we could slip a lock through there. Um, the one in the middle is a hinged box where you can slip a lock through that one. Uh, on the side there, we have zippers that can zip to the, or that can lock with those carabiners that are there on the end. Um, if you don't have a, a carabiner on the end, you can punch holes in the bag and lock the zipper to the holes in the bag. Um, next, please. Amazon, these I, got, these I got on Amazon. They are fake books that have lock boxes inside them. Uh, one is a keyed one and one is a coded one. There's also books that look like a London guidebook and things like that. So I like to pick the dictionary because it was useful in all rooms and not specific uh, to a specific country. Um, next, please. You can also get creative. The box on the left is a hinged wooden box um, and we added eye hooks to it. So the ones, you know, that have the little top and the, so the little hole and then a screw and you can put those on those wooden boxes and lock through there. And then I found a uh, zippered bag there and I put the holes in the side and locked the zipper through the holes in the side. Of course it was clear, so I had to make sure to hide the contents. Otherwise it gets real easy, real fast. All right, next slide please. A few other things that are super helpful when creating puzzles. We've got some black light pens and some black lights and some magnets. And those are things that I've also used for puzzles. I will explain how now. Next slide, please. So here come the puzzles. I like nitty gritty stuff. Of course, you can Google more kinds of puzzles and different ways of doing them. Um, I like to actually see things. So I put together a couple examples from the ones that I've used. The goal of a puzzle is to find the right combination of letters and numbers and then figure out what order to put them in. That's what you need to make sure that you are telling the people who are playing the game. This one is really simple. It can be uh, coded to any, any picture. I made this myself in about 10 minutes. You just print out a picture, you glue it onto popsicle sticks, you slice it uh, into those sticks, and then you spread out the sticks in the room. When they find the sticks, they put the puzzle together. And the code here is 3-1. Eight, five. Next, please. I like this one too. Also can be themed to many things. This is for our dinosaur escape room. I laminate this. I give them a whiteboard marker and they have to solve the maze. And as they solve the maze, they will go through four distinct numbers. And the numbers that they trace through are the numbers of the code. Of course, make sure when you're putting in the red herring numbers that you're putting them not where they're going to go through. Um, I like to put them in dead ends because I know for sure that they're not going to accidentally trace through those. Next, please. These are half and half puzzles. These are some of my favorites. Um, they, these are stormtroopers. I really enjoyed cutting the stormtroopers in half. Uh, the, sh the yellow sheet has the stormtroopers glued down. And then the code is written on the other halves of the stormtroopers. So when they find them, they match them up in order on that sheet, they create the puzzle. And then you can see on their legs, the code for this one is seven, five, nine for those. Next, please. You can also use actual puzzles. So for my zoo room, I had a puzzle like the one on the left where I wrote out the numbers. And as they put the puzzle together, each piece had a letter on it. They could see what the code was when they finished the puzzle. On the right was a slightly easier one for the dinosaur escape room. I wrote code, I wrote numbers on the legs. So when they put the legs of the dinosaurs into the puzzle, then they could see the order of the code. So if you have puzzles laying around, you can definitely use them um, and just create, create different codes like that. I will warn you, the building of the puzzle was harder than I thought it was going to be. In my space one, I had a floor 
puzzle that they had to build and it was the hardest clue in the whole game like they really struggled to put the puzzle together so if you're going to go with and these are these were third and fourth graders so if you're going to go with a real puzzle where they have to put all the pieces together make sure um, that you leave enough time for that next please so these are two examples of clues that I put on the boxes themselves so that they could know how to unlock that specific box. The first was the three lightsabers. So there was a bin full of pool noodle lightsabers and at the bottom of each one, I had written a number. So they had to go find the blue one, the green one, the purple one, and then the numbers were on the bottom and that was the code. For the, there's the London book um, that has a lock in it. I had a solar system map up. They had to put in planet three, Planet 8 and Planet 5, so 385 to unlock that, um, that box. Although the kids, this is one of the logic puzzles that was interesting to watch them solve. They thought it might be the number of letters in each word. So it's interesting to watch how different people approach um, a different problem. So next. This is a black light puzzle. I love black light puzzles and the kids love black light puzzles and they often get distracted shining the black light all over the room um, to see if there are other clues. I sometimes have to say, no, you found it guys, you found it, it's okay. Um, so for this one, I put the little black light. I wrote black light numbers on all of those ships and then they had to match the pictures, the silhouettes um, and find the numbers on the silhouetted ships to find the order. And this works with any theme. You can write black light numbers on anything. Um, next, please. So these are hard. These are harder than the ones that we've been doing so far. The Star Wars math one, I uh, laminated, gave them a dry erase marker and let them solve. Um, and that one took some doing. Uh, so if you're doing a family escape room experience, this is the one that the older kids and the parents are gonna tackle. Um, but they really enjoyed trying it out. And then the map to the stars was one I did with the color-coded lock. So the planets in the order that you see on that note, so there are planets that are in all caps, those planets were colored on the map to the stars and the order that they appeared on the note was the order that they had to go in the, um, into the lock. So next slide, please. This one I learned from an escape room and I really thought it was a different way of approaching things. I really enjoyed it. So this is the string numbers puzzle. I took some of those pegs that we have for making, um, making shapes and for the preschoolers with rubber bands, I attached strings to them. And so the yellow, the yellow board with the yellow string and the yellow piece of tape, you had to go three down, three over, three up and five down. And it looks when you're done, it looks like a four. And so that was the code. So this one was um, a very, a, it was a different kind of puzzle. Um, the kids enjoyed trying it out. So I also like to have some puzzles that are ways to find keys. So when we did Star Wars, I had a standee of Yoda. I put a little push pin in his hand and he was holding one of the keys. Um, in the zoo room, there was an alligator that had a key in its mouth. And I just put a sign by the alligator. It was a stuffed alligator, of course, uh, that said, are you brave enough to put your hand in the alligator's mouth? And if they were, then they would find the key. Um, in another one with the magnets, I had a tube that I had attached to a table so it couldn't be moved. And the key was down inside it. And so they had to find the magnet on a string and they dropped the magnet into the tube and then they would pull up the key. So I like to do things that are not just straight up difficult math puzzles or matching puzzles because then some of the kids who are still learning how to read can participate and solve problems and get the keys themselves. Also a quick note about the codes. I personally make random codes. Um, none of them match the theme because I want the participants to actually solve the puzzles, not come in with knowledge that they previously had. I find it helps to market the room. No, you don't have to know about Star Wars to do our Star Wars room. Um, other people like to do codes that match the theme, um, but I feel it gives an unfair advantage because I want it to be puzzle time and not trivia night. So next slide, please. So once you've set all of your puzzles, you know what puzzle is going to unlock which lock. Lay everything out on the table in front of you and start at the end. So if I'm doing the Star Wars room, I start with baby Yoda. I put baby Yoda in his box and I'm like, okay, which lock is going to unlock baby Yoda? and I lock that one up. 
And then I say, okay, what do I need to open that lock? And I put that in the previous bag. What's gonna unlock that? I lock that lock. Then what's gonna unlock that lock? All the way to the end until you're left with your first puzzle. Um, you can spread out the pieces. So when I do the half and half puzzles, I like to put the yellow piece of paper in early and then spread out the stormtroopers over like four or five boxes so they can't complete the puzzle right away. Just make sure that you put, that the last stormtrooper that you put in actually has a piece of code on him so that they don't solve it early. And this also helps create the flow of the room. So next please. Okay, once you have everything set up and all of your locks in place, um, it's time to set up the room. I used our main meeting room. We only had one at the time. I didn't go bananas with scene setting. I went to Party City. I bought a couple of the like six, five, six dollar decorations that you can get. Um, they have nice photo backdrops. Just don't put up the one that says happy birthday and you're good to go. Um, keep in mind that the more things you have out, the more red herrings you have out but also the more things people are going to break or spend too much time thinking about um, uh, that there might be a clue in there and uh, they might get sidetracked that way. So if you're on a schedule, a tight schedule to get people in and out of your room, it's worth remembering. If possible, look for beta testers to make sure that your room works. If you can watch them solve it, it's even better because you get an idea of what's too hard, what's too easy, what's working and what's not. Um, they can often find problems that you hadn't considered and you can sort of refashion certain things to make sure that it's going to be clear what you're going to do. Next slide, please. So for running the room, I signed people up for 30 minute slots. Most people can get through eight to 10 clues in 30 minutes. Uh, give yourself at least five minutes to reset between each group. 10 is better if you have it. Um, of course, you'll get faster resetting up the room as you, as you go through your day. Um, I have a big empty table in the middle of our room. I keep it empty. I ask everybody as they find clues to leave everything on that table open and unlocked so that when I go back in to reset it, I just set it up exactly the same way I set it up originally. I can quick put things where they belong, lock them all up, spread them all out again. Uh, when the groups arrive, bring them into the room, give them a quick rundown of the room, it only needs to be a few sentences. Uh, the one from my zoo room was just, oh no, the animals have escaped from their cages and they need to be put back where they belong. Not only that, two animals are missing. Can you rescue and find them and put everyone back in their home before the time runs out? Good luck. I use two digital kitchen timers set to 30 minutes. I leave one in the room and I keep one for myself so I know how they're doing. I check on the groups after about 10 minutes to make sure that things are going okay, to ask them if they need hints. This is particularly useful if they've never done an escape room before. It's really, it really sucks to get stuck on that first clue and not really know what you're supposed to be doing. So I check on them to make sure that they at least have some momentum going forward. After 30 minutes, they'll either claim victory or they'll have to admit defeat. Have something for them either way. If you can get them to pose in front of the photo uh, things that you hung up earlier, it can do a lot for you on social media if they're allowing. All right, now, a quick note on making things cheaper. So first use whatever you have around the library, whatever you can scrounge up. Uh, children's librarians are notorious for having stash piles of many things that can be used. So try to use what you've already got. You can even ask for donations of locks. It might work, people might have some. Another thing you can do is uh, add more puzzles and have fewer locks. So a puzzle, when you solve it, might only give you one digit of the final lock. And that way you can spread out uh, having more things that you're doing and fewer actual things that you have to open. Um, next, please. All right, we're going to pivot here. We're going to talk about taking this to schools. Um, a school in my area asked me to bring an escape room to them and they were going to send groups a whole classroom of 25 30 students through at a time to solve the escape room and i was thinking about this i have eight to ten puzzles laid out in the clear line and i thought man i have no idea how 25 kids are going to do this in any sort of non-chaotic disastrous destroy the media center sort of way and then at 3 a.m i had a revelation 
And unlike most of my 3 a.m. revelations, this one was actually worth something. So we're gonna go through it right now. You ready? Okay, next slide, please. Instead of making one path with 10 clues, I made five paths with five clues each. Okay, nobody faint. Next page. So what I did is I took baby Yoda as an example. I put him in the last toolbox. I put that red extra lock on him and I put five locks of different colors on that lock. And then I had five groups of five kids go through the path, each their own path. And when they got to the end, they found a colored key and they could unlock one of the locks on Baby Yoda. So when all the teams had finished, they would have unlocked all the locks. Now, I know it sounds like a whole lot of paths and a whole lot of clues, and it is, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So the black light planet sheet that I had with the silhouettes, give each team a different set of silhouettes. And you've got the same puzzle, everybody needs a black light, but basically the puzzle is already intact. Um, print out five different mazes and put numbers in the mazes and everybody gets a maze puzzle. Um, it's so much easier to make five iterations of the same sort of puzzle than it is to make 25 different puzzles and it also makes sure the paths are sort of equal and are working on the same thing um, so that you don't have one path that's like so much cooler than the others. Um, to avoid them tearing apart the media center, next slide please. I gave them each team got a sheet of the things they needed to find. So all of these things were scattered around the room. Each item that the team needed to find had a small piece of masking tape on it with the team's number. So they knew when they found it, if it was for them or not. And then I placed large numbers on the floor on eight and a half by 11 paper. I just taped them to the floor so that each team had a home base and the kids would bring all the things back to their home base, solve all the puzzles, open it all up, find the last little key. And uh, they would leave everything open on the floor for me so that I could easily reset the room after they had left. Um, the teacher split the classes into groups. Everyone was able to participate. It's a lot easier to solve a puzzle with five people than 25 people. Um, the only exception was the kindergarten class. For the kindergarten class, I, um, I only put one colored lock on the last uh, Baby Yoda thing, and we walked through one of the paths together. So I asked for volunteers. The teacher gave me volunteers, and uh, they all came up and one at a time and helped me solve different puzzles. Um, I was afraid they were going to be bored. They were riveted. And honestly, there's nothing more satisfying than hearing that lock click open. So I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie, who actually has an equally awesome but different approach to outreach, and she'll also handle our digital escape rooms. Hi. Um, so just to launch from where Laura was, I run um, escape rooms for our system, so I'm not always the one going out. So some of these things are simplifications or changes that make it easier to teach other librarians how to do your escape room, because as wonderful as 25 clues is, that is very difficult to teach to other staff members sometimes, um, especially if you have limited time to try to get uh, somebody up and running on it. Um, the link at the very top, there is an Amazon wish list link. It is arguably the cheapest way to put together an escape room kit. Um, it's a toolbox with a hasp and several locks. Um, the black lights and things like that, they're all in that link, um, which is again clickable in the handout, I believe. Um, if you plan to store them somewhere, um, make get the big plastic storage bins. Uh, that way you can label the outside with Hey, space escape room, animal escape room, general escape room. That way when you have to send it out, you have it in a nice storage area that you can just put in delivery or take over to the other branch. And then put make a binder with the little plastic sleeve inserts that you can print off the setup instructions and any uh, duplicate clues in case something gets lost because it often does on outreach. Um, if it's just a paper clue, you can have a copy ready to go in that binder and it keeps it organized for yourself and any other staff members running. Um, if you are a multi-branch system, it's super important to make sure that when that everything is correct when you send it out and when you return it. So you're going to want an inventory for all of your kits that includes all of the boxes, all of the bags, 
all of the red herring puzzles. I also like to use puzzles in my escape rooms, but I frequently use jigsaw puzzles as red herrings. Um, a red herring is a clue that doesn't actually lead to the answer. And it's an interesting discussion to kids about how you decide when to switch your attention from something that's not productive. Um, but the, the rest of the instructions here, make sure that things work, make sure that locks are set um, to a generic law, uh, to a generic code so that you don't accidentally forget what the last uh, escape room you ran was and never have that lock again. Um, those are all important procedures to have in place if you are sending them between librarians. Uh, Laura for pre-readers walked her kindergartners through one path together. Um, I actually have a whole different escape room procedure where we do, it's, it's similar, but it's usually designed for a larger group. Honestly, I've used teachers, paid teachers for this a lot of times. Um, they have great sets of clues pre-built and then you just get to be a rock star that you have the teacher help you hide the clues sequentially so that only one clue is available to find at a time. And then you come together, read the clue, and there's an activity to do. Sometimes it's like a little game that you'll play together. Sometimes it's a skills worksheet. It's something that helps keep the kids engaged at school, builds a skill usually, and um, lets them feel like they're having all of the excitement of the escape room without them having to figure out how to use locks. All right, digital escape rooms. Um, for many of us, this will be the only kind of escape room we get to run this year, and maybe the kind that you have the least experience with. I hope that many of you um, have gotten to play the escape room that I sent out. Um, lots of the types of things that we'll be talking about were in there, and so hopefully you have a sense if you didn't, um, it's available to play afterwards as well. When you are thinking about building an escape room, especially a digital escape room, these are the questions that you need to answer. We'll be going through these questions topic by topic to help really address the structure of how to even think about building a digital escape room. So <laughs> thank you, Julie. Next slide. The first question is, who is it for? This is where to start. It's who your audience is. You do this with every program you run. And while you can't necessarily limit registration for a digital escape room like you might be able to for an in-person escape room, it definitely informs how you proceed from here, what kinds of themes you use, what kind of puzzles you plan to use, um, who or where you're going to advertise it with or to. Um, are you building it for individual play or for play as a family? Um, knowing those kinds of things up front makes answering all of the rest of these questions much easier. Theme is another great place to start. Once you have an idea of who is it for, you can decide on your theme. In a digital escape room, you have to be careful of copyright. You are not limited, like uh, you are not limited in audience like you would be in a classroom visit or in an in-library program. That makes certain IPs, for Harry Potter, anything Disney, Star Wars, Stranger Things, those are going to be much more difficult, to, not impossible, but difficult to stay inside fair use. Um, if you do really want to pursue one of those um, I, if, and your library or library system has a lawyer, it may be worth checking in with them. Um, but there are a lot of other themes you can do. Um, I provided some here. If you have something cool about your local area or like um, the history of your town, those things can be included. A historic event or period, um, a Civil War escape room, a World War II escape room, a um, 1970s escape room, I don't, you know, whatever theme you think would fit your community. Um, science concepts are great, especially if you plan to send any of these to schools as opportunities for them to use. Um, the teachers and uh, library media people um, that I have been talking to have been really eager to hear the kinds of ways that we can help take pressure off them while they are struggling. So if you have things like science or history, just, you know, touch base with your teacher, say, hey, I've created this for this age group. Can you guys use it? Um, it'll get a lot of traffic for your escape room and it will be a real benefit to them. Uh, what I have been using for my public facing escape rooms are stories out of copyright. Um, things like Alice in Wonderland, which is the other one I wrote, Sherlock, Shakespeare, 
Austin, Dracula, Wizard of Oz, Treasure Island, Frankenstein, all of these things that are now public domain, you can use those stories, characters, and even artwork from the original publications in order to build your digital escape room. No copyright problems. People love those things too. Um, if you say you're going to do a Dracula va like vampire escape room, that's going to get just as much excitement sometimes as some of those other IPs that are going to be more difficult for you to use legally. Um, if you are using illustrations, make sure you're using ones that are Creative Commons or public domain or you've gotten permission. It's a little weird about using memes and GIFs. Um, copyright law is a little iffy there. But if you want to stay on the safe side, um, CC search, which is Creative Commons search, is really helpful. And Google has a Creative Commons search as well. Next slide. What kind of puzzles should you use? Um, lots of people get hung up here. It's hard to imagine at first where to start. That's why we started with the theme. Sometimes that theme can help you decide what story that you're going to tell is. Um, one of my colleagues built a Snow White based um, uh, escape room, excuse me. And because of that, she had a better idea of what the story was and how she could fit in puzzles. This is a long list of puzzle types. Um, you played about 10 of them, I think, in the escape room that I just offered. And most of the other ones listed here are variations of those. Things like reading analog clocks, um, is a, especially for in games for children, are difficult. Um, the nursery rhyme one required a significant amount of background knowledge. It helped to know the nursery rhymes in order to win that game. Um, noticing patterns is a really basic one. And lots of these are really just noticing patterns in different ways, math, language, things like that. I have a slide with some resources, um, which I'll, again, I submitted it too late. I'm sorry, Kathy, uh, <laughs> to get the links um, anywhere other than the handouts, but they are in the handout. And um, so it's going to have things like the translator tools and stuff like that. But please borrow my puzzles. Like when you play an escape room, if you like it, don't steal the puzzle outright, but look at how the puzzle was built. And you can use that structure to build your own puzzles. Next slide, please. This is the list. Um, and uh, I will make sure that this gets it. The links should all work, hopefully. Um, and if not, I will make sure that they get in a Google document or something like that. And thank you for whoever posted the link earlier. Um, but these are different different generators. You can use Morse code. Um, I believe that one was in the game you played. Jigsaw puddles, letter, letter mazes, Navajo code, um, and Google Translate, which is a great one for different languages. And what system are you using? Um, Today we're going to talk about Google Forms. It's free, it's widely available, it's relatively simple to use. Um, before we get into the how-tos of Google Forms, you'll notice the two pictures on screen. Those are me planning. <laughs> um, when I'm at the office, I tend to use little, um, little post-it notes torn up to kind of show me where my paths are. These were both for kind of a more choose your own adventure game that I was designing. That's why the paths get bigger and bigger and bigger instead of just dead ending. Um, but it sometimes helps to write things out on note cards or post it notes so you can see a general idea of um, the direction that your puzzles are heading. Now, if you are using Google Forms, um, there are only two types of questions that you can be, do to be verified. And those are multiple choice and short answer. Everything else, Google can't check. So you're going to want to make sure that those two, all of your puzzles boil down to those two kinds of answers if you're using Google Forms. Multiple choice is obviously A, B, C, or D. Short answer is going to be a phrase or shorter. And, it, um, and capitalization matters in that. So you're going to want to make sure that that's included in your instructions. Um, it's going to work like a flowchart. Things will dead end and send them back one. So again, feel free to use whatever organization um, method works for you. Now, I also use Google Docs just to create an outline, um, just as a third method that I realized I didn't put on here. And then not, one last important thing that many people, and I did not know when I started, is that you can randomize your answer order on Google Forms. This really helps eliminate any bias you might have. Generally, um, we don't think we have bias as to where we put our answers, <laughs> but um, 
frequently people will always pick B or pick B, you know, 50% of the time. And in your head, you just start to do that in your answers. So if you allow Google to randomize your answers, you can make it much easier for yourself. You can put the correct answer first every single time. So as you're reading through it, you can see that the first, the correct answer should feed to the next section and all the other ones will go back. Um, and by doing that and letting Google randomize, you're saving yourself a lot of work. This is just a screenshot of the game you played if you played it already. Um, I'm sorry if you haven't, this gives away an answer. <laughs> um, so this is a multiple choice question with verification. It shows uh, the question, the four options, and then to the right of those four options, you see where it says go to section um, and it gives the section's name. Section six is oh no, that's one of my dead ends that will send you back to this question again to try another answer. The only answer that works is the fourth answer that sends you to the next section, section seven. You'll also see down at the bottom where it says description, go to section based on answer. That's how we get all of those different, those different options. And then shuffle option order is how you make Google randomize it for you. Next slide. And this is just a short answer with verification. Um, it works very much like um, it works very much like the other one. You set which answer is acceptable. In this case, it was just the letter B. And, it's, and it says what uh, message displays on Google underneath it. It, op it operates a little bit differently as a short answer than as a multiple choice answer. A short answer doesn't actually let you create another dead end slide. You have to create the error message right there on the right side after the correct answer. And then how are you keeping track? You've done all of this amazing work. Um, the, sh the shortest it's ever taken me to create a digital escape room, a full one was about eight hours. So this is a lot of work. Um, the more you do, the quicker you get, um, but you need to keep track of that. So how are you doing that? Uh, usually I gather statistics by requiring a question called how many people played, including you. Um, sometimes people misunderstand this question and have just said lots because they're trying to guess how many people have ever played. <laughs> um, but it gives me a, just a rough idea of how many people have completed the escape room. And then I can include that on the statistics for programming for the month. Um, it, it works a lot like any other digital program. You, the, those um, requirements through the Library of Michigan for reporting are available. Um, much like for live escape rooms, you're going to want to use beta testers and make sure that players can contact you via email. Um, the other escape room that I built, the Alice in Wonderland one, has one question in particular that is very difficult, apparently, and I get many emails about what the correct answer is or why the correct answer is because they just had to guess their way through. Um, once the, And then I can respond to them and they understand that there was a logic that they missed and they're much happier with the game as a whole. Also, leave some space for feedback. Um, if somebody really thinks that what that that one puzzle is way too hard, well, they can tell you there. Or if they find an error that your beta testers missed, it's really important to be able to see that. The nice thing about Google Forms is every time somebody create, um, answers a question, it is entered into a spreadsheet that Google Forms automatically creates in your Google account. And it has all of, it has the timestamp so you can see when people played and you can um, see all of their answers. Obviously, most of their answers should be the same because they have to be correct in order to move forward. So I usually hide all of the columns except for the how many people played and feedback options, as well as the timestamp. That way I can just see the things that matter to me moving forward. Next slide. That is everything we have for now. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. If anyone has anything that they noticed, want to ask about, would like to share their brilliant idea. Yeah, um, if you want to put it in the chat, you can, or I will also um, give you all permission if anybody wants to unmute um, and ask away. So, any questions out there? I, I'm seeing lots of good comments in the in the chat. How many puzzles have I used for Google Forms? That's a great question. Um, let's see, I'm gonna hop into this one real quick. Um, I had, for the last, 
It, the one you guys played, I have. It looks like 15 or 16 puzzles. I think I had about the same for the Alice in Wonderland. Maybe a few less because they were more difficult. Um, I used about 10 for the one that I made. So somewhere between 10 and 20. Um, I, as far as other places that you can build your escape room, I have seen some um, built into slides that have different sections of the slides created as links. Um, that makes it easier to do things like find an object inside a puzzle because you can create a link of just that section of Google Slides. Um, and it will link to a puzzle, to the next page, whatever you like. I just haven't done a lot with that. Um, you can also build on breakout, uh, build on breakout edu if you have a subscription. Um, if you've never built or played with this uh, digital escape rooms before, and your library has a little bit of budget, it's not a bad idea. Um, I played with, uh, I played with breakout edu's escape rooms for most of the years that I was building puzzles um, in person. And they gave me a much better idea of what the logic of escape rooms can look like both in, in person and digitally. There's a question here about any ideas for teens. Most of the people playing my nursery rhymes have been teens. Um, so I don't know if you're talking about themes or puzzle levels for teens. I think I'm not sure if they want to specify Novi. Um, was that for theme or for puzzles? Meanwhile, um, or do you want to come on? Puzzle types and themes. So <laughs> anybody have an idea they want to share? Yeah. When you're, oh, I'm sorry. When you're working with the teams, um, the easiest thing I found is to just complicate the things you already have. So when I, uh, do it for the kids and I have the like the black light puzzle for example on the box that needs to be unlocked by the black light I have a little strip of paper that has a black light and the puzzles or the ships that they need to highlight in order to open that lock um, you don't have to put those things on there um, you can just leave that up to them to figure out how it all goes together um, you can do puzzles with more pieces you can do um, just give them fewer hints built built in uh, and that will that will make it a little bit harder in general so that's what I've done great um, I, I'm sorry I just threw in the chat a link to my slightly harder escape room um, that might give you some ideas for types of puzzles that can be appealing to teens adults or kids who are just really proficient at puzzles um, it includes some things that require physical props like chops or like um, toothpicks, nothing complicated, but um, they're just more in depth puzzles than knowing the nursery rhyme. All right. We have a question here, um, and I think it's just open to anyone. Has anybody tried an escape room via Zoom? Trying to puzzle out how to provide um, those puzzles. <laughs> I know people are doing choose your own adventure books um, over Zoom with Zoom meets. So they read the section and then they have the kids decide what they're going to do next. I presume with some screen sharing, you could do a digital escape room that you then screenshot the, the puzzle and had the kids solve it over Zoom. And then you could just tell them yes or no um, or give them hints or whatever. So it would be more of a group experience. I know many teachers also um, now have the camera overhead so they can be seen writing and they can hold up images and things like that. And so, um, you know, don't forget that these digital escape rooms or even your outreach escape rooms, maybe making them available to teachers to do from home um, would be a fantastic break for them. Um, and they have the equipment. Um, not all of them, <laughs> but many hopefully have the equipment to support something like that to demonstrate it. Um, and we have a marketing question as well. How, how might you market them, especially to people who don't know what they are? 
If your library has a population of puzzlers, um, mine does, uh, they're a great start. Um, people who, we have a circulating collection of jigsaw puzzles. So those are people who may be interested in solving puzzles um, of a different kind. Um, and if you work the word puzzle in a lot, everyone knows what a puzzle is, even if they don't know what an escape room is. Um, and people enjoy solving things. So if you start with that, that could be useful. We mostly just shared on our Facebook page and Kathy very graciously also threw it up on the CSLP page. <laughs> um, so if you have resources like that to share in your community, um, those are great ways to get the word out. I don't know about anyone else who's run them. Yeah, we put them in our newsletter, our digital newsletter that goes out and on our Facebook page and on our website under, mine was a children's one, so we put it under the children's programs. Um, I created it in uh, April. So people were looking at our website more frequently um, than, than they usually did before. So just putting the link on the website and saying, hey, this is a program that kids can do at home, um, that seemed to, to help us. And I've, for whoever asked, I've left mine live. Um, so I, people still answer it. It's not being promoted anymore. So if people happen to find it, then they do it. And uh, it's mine's on Google Forms as well. So it just lives forever there. Um, same for both of mine and I just because all I keep my Google Drive sorted by most frequently updated or most recently updated I get to see every time somebody has up has played because the spreadsheet tracking the answers of the Google form floats back to the top. Wonderful. Um, I don't think I've missed one. But if I have, you have the power to unmute if you'd like to ask again. Um, any other questions for Stephanie and Laura? Oh, I didn't put a picture at the end. Oh. <laughs> They'll just have to look at your face right now. <laughs> if you do have any questions later that you think of as you're going back through the slides or just pondering things, um, please reach out, contact us. That is my work phone number. Um, I will answer it when I'm there. <laughs> Well, and I want to thank uh, Laura and Stephanie for uh, kind of charging forth with this idea. They they really are passionate about escape rooms. It looks like we have many others on today with us um, that enjoy escape rooms, but we also have uh, folks that are new to escape rooms. So uh, feel free to reach out to Stephanie or Laura for help on that, or you can always contact me, Kathy Lancaster, at the Library of Michigan. If you have any additional questions, I'll be sending out a copy of this recording today. Um, the handouts with all the links are in the chat as well as um, today's webinar survey. So don't forget to open that survey up and fill that out for us today. And thanks to the Institute of Museum and Library Services for supporting this program as well. All thanks, right. Thank you. Thank you all so much.